Welcome to Circular Motion Lesson 1. This is the start of our further mechanics section of the course. Now back in year 12 you would have spent a lot of time with your mechanics teacher learning about linear motion. So looking at concepts such as displacement, velocity, acceleration etc. Circular motion is now our higher level way of looking at motion itself. When you think about it quite a few things that we look at in science and in physics move in a circle. Just to give you two very simple examples, from astronomy we can look at a planet orbiting the sun such as the earth or even the moon orbiting the earth. When we move it down onto the particle physics level, onto the quantum mechanics level, then we can look at electrons orbiting the nucleus in an atom. So we can see that circular motion has its applications from both the large scale all the way down to the small scale. In this lesson we're going to look at a few basic concepts just to start to get our heads around circular motion before we go into the more involved theory over the next few lessons. Firstly then we just need to make sure that we understand a few definitions when it comes to the circle from a physics point of view. From maths we know that a line connecting the centre of the circle to the outside of the circle is called the radius. Now if I were to draw on here a second radius there are two other measurables that we require from this circle. The first is this green line here. That is the portion of the circle that is between the two radii that we've drawn. This portion of the circle is called an arc length and has the symbol S. The third piece of information that we need from this circle is the angle in between these two radii. Now because we're talking about an angle we know full well that any unknown angle just takes theta as its symbol. Of course there has to be an equation that links all three of those together and the equation is theta the angle in between those two radii is equal to s the arc length divided by r the radius of the circle. When it comes to units for s and r we can use any length unit that we like. So we could use meters and meters, we can use centimeters and centimeters, we can use light years and light years if we really wanted to, as long as the unit for both S and R is the same. However, when it comes to theta, we need to use a unit that some of you may not have come across before. That unit then is known as the radian. The radian is a natural unit and when you were looking at SI units at the start of next year you would have been told that the radian is our base unit for angle. In physics we tend not to use degrees, the radian is by far the more pure method of measuring angle. Let me show you now what the definition of the radian is. If we take our circle and we draw back on two radii again, R and R. Here we still have an arc length in between those two radii. If however the length of that arc is exactly the same as the length of each of the radii, which obviously have to be the same, then the angle in between those two radii is defined as one radian. In order to link that back to our previous equation we can see that theta is equal to s divided by r. In our definition though we have made and we have set the arc length to be r. Therefore our angle becomes r divided by r which equals 1 
and that is the definition of the radian. Now in order to consider how many radians there are in a circle and how we can find some kind of equivalent between the radian and the degree, let's take our equation again. Theta is equal to S divided by R. Now the radius R of a circle is set. If however we were to take the entire circle, okay, starting from here and coming all the way around and back to the top. What's the arc length involved there? Well, the arc length involved is the entire circumference of the circle. From basic geometry, we know that the circumference of the circle is 2 pi multiplied by the radius. Plugging that in for arc length, we can see that theta is now equal to 2 pi r, that's the circumference, divided by r as in the equation. Our r on the top and bottom cancel each other out and what we're left with is that theta is equal to 2 pi. Now what's the significance of that? 2 pi is therefore the total angle that we can get from a radian's point of view in a circle. Our equivalence is that 2 pi in radians is equivalent to 360 degrees. In order to break that down further, pi radians would be 180 degrees, pi by 2 radians would be 90 degrees, etc. This is of course one of the few times in physics where we're going to allow you to give an answer in terms of pi. The vast majority of the time we would turn around to you and say that, that would be too many significant figures. But this one time only we will allow you to express an angle as long as it is in radians in terms of pi. Now, in terms of writing the unit itself for radians, we have a couple of different choices. We can either use RAD as a shorthand for radians as our unit. We can also leave it completely blank, and I'll explain why that's the case in a moment. The one that you may see in some old textbooks is a superscript of a C. That unfortunately is an obsolete measure and if you see that you're going to understand what it means but under no circumstances in physics are we going to use that notation to denote radians. Now back to the idea of why we can leave it dimensionless. If we go back to the equation I said earlier that both S and R have the unit of length as long as they both have the same unit, they cancel each other out. Technically, our angle here, our theta, is dimensionless. If we were being really purely accurate, we would leave it with no unit at all. However, it is fully expected that we can write RAD afterwards in order to denote that we have pi radians and we're not just talking about here pi as a number just by itself. So when we come back to our original idea we know from a unit's point of view that if we're going to go for our base unit s must be in meters r must be in meters and theta must therefore be in radians or as I just said you can leave that dimensionless if you so choose. Now to take things one step further. If we consider the circle once again we've now got to consider objects moving in a circle. What we've looked at so far is all well and good from that mass point of view where we're just trying to get ideas about a circle out. We now need to start thinking about objects moving in a circle. 
Let's say that an object starts here at the top of the circle and is moving clockwise around the circle in that direction. One of these three measures that we've looked at so far will give us the best idea of exactly how far the object has moved around the circle. Let's think about this logically. R is not the right me me measurement to use. R is the radius of the circle and is therefore fixed for a given circle. It doesn't accurately represent or cannot accurately represent how far we've moved around the circle. We're left therefore with two choices, our arc length and our angle theta. Now the natural idea might be to choose arc length. However, that leaves comparisons between two different circles very difficult to do. If we have a larger circle, the Earth going round the Sun, if it moves a quarter of a circle round, that is an extremely big distance, especially when we compare that to a quarter of a revolution for an electron moving round in an atom. Arc lengths therefore change significantly as we increase the radius. The one thing in this circle though that doesn't change no matter how much we enlarge or shrink this circle down is the angle itself. If an object has moved around a quarter of a circle, it's moved pi by two radians, regardless of how big that circle is. If it's moved halfway round, from the top, the 12 o'clock positions we've drawn it, to the six o'clock positions we've drawn it, we know full well it has moved half a circle or it has moved pi radians. This arc length here could be as big as it wants depending on how big the circle is. We can, by using theta, very easily compare the motion between two different size circles. Therefore, theta is the base measurement that we're going to be using in all of our measurements when it comes to circular motion, as opposed to R or S. The phrase that we use to describe theta here is angular displacement. Now using the term angular displacement hopefully shouldn't come as that much of a surprise to you. Let's just recap what we did last year as part of linear motion. Displacement was our most basic idea. How far in a straight line is it from point A to point B? Angular displacement, how far is it from point A point to point B along the arc of a circle? or more accurately what is the angle between the radii at point A and point B. Going back to our linear motion then just to recap displacement we use the symbol S and we use the measurement we use the unit of meters. For velocity we used a V and we had the unit meters per second. For acceleration we use the symbol A and we had the unit meters per second squared. Because we're talking about motion obviously time is always going to come into it and time always has the unit of seconds. Now let's think back. How did we get from displacement in order to calculate velocity? Well, we use time, and more accurately, we divide it by time. So in order to calculate velocity from displacement, we divide it by time. In order to get from velocity to acceleration, once again, we divide it by time. Now let's look at the exact same things, but with circular motion. We start off with angular displacement and we've already said that the symbol for angular displacement is theta and the unit is the radian. In order to calculate angular velocity 
from angular displacement just like we did over here we're going to divide by time so angular velocity is angular displacement divided by time or to be more physically accurate the angular velocity is the rate of change of angular displacement the symbol we use for angular velocity is an omega now note that this isn't the letter w it's the lowercase omega the last letter in the greek alphabet calculating omega then we're just going to take displacement and divide it by time this equation here is just the circular motion equivalent of saying that v is equal to s over t or velocity is equal to displacement over time this is the linear motion version this is the circular motion version from a unit point of view when we divide by time we have our per second so here the unit of angular velocity becomes radians per second we can do exactly the same again with angular velocity to get to angular acceleration if we divide by time velocity divided by time is acceleration angular acceleration has the symbol alpha and hopefully you've worked out by now that the unit is radians per second squared time of course is still going to be called t and is still going to have the unit of seconds time makes absolutely no difference whether it's in circular motion or linear motion time is going to be time and time is going to be measured in exactly the same way now the good news for our part of the course is that we are actually going to be ignoring angular acceleration altogether we're going to be only looking at the case where angular velocity omega is a constant if omega is a constant what that implies from our point of view is that alpha angular acceleration is zero that's what we're going to be using as the basis of this part of the course we don't go any deeper into circular motion and we don't look at it in any more depth of course if you go forward to university level uh, and you look at either physics or maths or engineering or something like that and you look at any kind of rotational dynamics you will at that point start to take angular acceleration into account but for our part of the course and what we're going to be studying now angular acceleration is zero angular velocity we are going to take as a constant so let's now have a further look at omega this angular velocity we need to make sure that we understand this and understand exactly what it really means uh, for our equations and for our concepts let's look at some equations first let's bring back onto the screen our equation from earlier theta is equal to s over r now we've just said that omega is equal to theta divided by t the rate of change of angular displacement is equal to omega for those of you that do further maths or uh, really understand differentiation etc we probably really should say that it is d theta by dt okay if we want to be really pure about it that's more putting it into the rate of change point of view but let's just stick with this for now omega is equal to theta over t now if we come back to this equation up here we know that theta is equal to s divided by r one of those things is changing with respect to time we know though that this being a circle r has to remain a constant if r is not a constant then it's by definition not a circle anymore therefore the only thing that is changing with respect to time as our object moves around is our arc length s 
what we can do then is take our equation for theta and substitute it in to our equation for omega. But remembering that r is the constant and s is what is actually changing. I'm going to make that equation look at first not very nice. And I'm going to rewrite it as theta is equal to s multiplied by 1 over r. Just to separate the variable with respect to time that is s and our radius or 1 over the radius which is a constant. Omega is then going to be s divided by t, that's our variable bit, multiplied by the 1 over r, which is our constant bit. Now from linear mechanics we know that s divided by t is just v, it's just our velocity. Omega is therefore v multiplied by 1 over r or to tidy it up and make it look nice omega is equal to v divided by r v of course in this situation is how fast the object is moving around the circle it's still measured in meters per second just like we would measure linear velocity it is still a velocity so therefore meters per second is the right unit to use for that the final piece of theory that we need to think about for this lesson is what happens when the object makes one complete circle. It starts from the top of the circle, and I will label that as point A, goes round all the way and comes back to point A. It has completed one complete circle. In this situation, in order to calculate how long it's taken, we use time period. And instead of using a lowercase t, we use a capital T to denote that it has completed one full rotation. So time period is how long does it take for the object to get from A, go all around the circle and back to A. Now, if we think about that from a clock point of view, if it was a second hand, the time period for a second hand would be one minute. It starts at 12, goes all the way around, and goes back to 12 again in one minute. For the minute hand, that will be an hour, and for the hour hand, that would be 12 hours on a standard clock. For some systems, time period, though, can be extremely small, especially if we take something like an electron orbiting in an atom. In that case, it may sometimes be better to measure the frequency of orbit. In other words, how many times does it go around per second? Now, this equation and how these two link together is really a GCC equation. F, the frequency, is 1 over T. Now, let's apply that to our idea of angular velocity. And we're going to start from the point of view of omega is equal to theta divided by T. Now, for one complete revolution, we need to think of two things. Firstly, what angle has that object travelled through? Well, earlier we said that if it goes from the top all the way around and back to the top, Okay, in degrees, that's going to be 360, but we don't want 360 anymore. We want it in radians, and in radians, we know that theta is going to be 2 pi. The time for one complete revolution, well, we've just defined that over here as capital T. So there is a slightly different way of looking at omega. We can say that omega is equal to 2 pi over t. 
Substituting in though, we have 1 over t in this equation, and therefore we can say that omega is equal to 2 pi times the frequency. Sometimes you will hear, and quite often in fact you will hear, theta referred to as angular frequency. We can see here is our angle and here is our frequency. As far as our bit of the course goes, angular frequency and angular velocity are pretty much interchangeable terms, so you can use them uh, either, as long as you use them correctly, I don't really mind. So let's have a look at a question now. What is the angular velocity of a second hand and a minute hand of a clock? What I suggest you do is go away, grab a piece of paper, try and work out the answer yourself. And once you're ready, you can unpause the video and we'll have a look at the answers in a moment. So hopefully you've had a go at that and you've got answers yourselves. One of the first things we notice about the question is that if we try and apply the equation omega is equal to v over r, it's not going to work because we don't have v and we don't have r. And that is perfectly fine for the question. We do have some other equations we're going to use. We don't know how long every, the second hand is. We don't know how long the minute hand is. This equation is useless to us. So let's get rid of it. Instead, we're going to use the equation omega is equal to 2 pi over t. Both 2 and pi are constants, they're just numbers, and t is the time period. Well, we know how long it takes a second hand to go round, and we know how long it takes a minute hand to go round. So let's do the second hand first. If we start to plug some numbers into the equation, Omega is equal to 2 pi divided by, well, the time period of a second hand is 60 seconds. We can immediately write that as pi divided by 30. And that's what your calculator will give you if you just plug the numbers in. But if you hit that S to D button, we can make it look nice at 0 0.1. 5 radians per second given to three significant figures. For the minute hand, same equation, omega is equal to 2 pi over t is equal to 2 pi divided by, well now we need an hour but converted into seconds, so 2 pi over 60 times 60 which is 2 pi divided by 3600 or to simplify that pi divided by 1800 converting that into a non-fraction without pi we end up with 1.75 times 10 to the minus 3 radians per second. Hopefully you got that, obviously if not go back just check your working uh, and make sure that you can actually get the answers that I've given you on the screen. So let's summarise the lesson then. Firstly we looked at the definition of the radian and we said that obviously in a full circle we have 360 degrees and that is the equivalent of 2 pi radians. We then looked at angular displacement with the equation theta is equal to s over r. Now of course that links back into the definition of the radian. The way the radian is defined is when we've got an arc length equal to r we have one radian. The definition of angular velocity then is the rate of change of angular displacement uh, and we end up with omega is equal to v over r. 
We also showed that omega is equal to 2 pi over t, which is equal to 2 pi times the frequency of rotation. Now, to be honest, I would much rather that you use those versions. So omega is 2 pi over t or omega is equal to 2 pi f first. Um, so in other words, attempt to use those equations first before you try to use omega is equal to v over r. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.